Uh, thank you. Let, let me digress for just a minute to come back. There were a couple of points in the earlier discussion I want to come back to. Uh, we've heard uh, from several people concern about provosts and provost interest in MOOCs and so forth. I just want to say I don't think that's where the real issue is. I think the real issue is with boards, both public and private boards. And uh, I think that uh, till they're educated as to both the strengths and shortcomings of MOOCs, you're going to get a lot of pressure from them. Then they're going to exert that pressure on the administrative uh, force. Uh, people at your college. I'm going down to the AGB, the Association of Governing Boards in April. I convinced them to do a short workshop on distance learning and higher education. And I'm the only sort of contrarian in the sense that I'm, I'm going to be raising the cautionary notes, both in terms of funding and in terms of um, uh, use of them. So I, I don't think MOOCs spell the end of higher education as we know it uh, at all. Second thing I want to say is that um, there's an excellent group underway uh, through Gates Foundation Research. You may be familiar with it. Uh, they had a very interesting research conference in uh, Dallas in December. I went to that. It was marred by a nice storm. Some people couldn't get in. Some people couldn't get out. Some people left early. Uh, but about 45 people presented. And, uh, mo and I must tell you, most of the research is really work in progress. You hear all these things about completion rates and so usually from one or two examples, very small data points. So that hopefully that the, um, the Gates work through uh, Siemens uh, at Athabasca, who's on his way to UTA, uh, will hopefully give us a broader base for that. You may want to look at that. I think there is some mention of some of the papers on the website. If you go to Gates, that will direct you to Athabasca in Canada, and from there you can access it. And then the last thing I just want to say is that I think when you talk about MOOCs, you have to be careful in terms of talking about MOOCs that are designed for profit and those that are designed not for profit, okay? In, in terms of understanding different, degree, different examples and so forth. So what I want to spend a few minutes with you today is uh, to talk to you about a, a, a MOOC. Someone said um, uh, this, this is a MOOC in progress, okay? Uh, I, I became interested in MOOCs as the discussion swirled about, about how MOOCs were going to change and revolutionize higher education. And I've been in higher education long enough to know that when the Western Governors Conference was announced in 1970 and distance learning was going to do away with most of the Western expansion needed by higher education out there, we know it didn't happen. Okay? Western still argues that they're going to be able to do that, lower costs and so forth. These so-called you know, game changers, uh, new killer technology and so forth, have been around for a long time. You can trace it back to the printing press and perhaps even before uh, in terms of how things were going to change things. We still, in most cases, accept the fact the face-to-face, in-person instruction. Now, now, having said that, I also think MOOCs have a great role to play. I'll have more to, about this to say tomorrow, more to say about this tomorrow when I talk about my paper. But my primary interest in the MOOC that I'm working on is what I call in the general area of civic education and civic competency. Okay? So I'm working on a MOOC which is supposed to start March 3rd. Uh, that deals with congression the 2014 congressional elections. And that MOOC will take students through uh, everything from some campaign finance uh, information to the role of the media, to expenditures, to how political parties organize and select candidates. It also, if I'm successful, will actually have them uh, exposed to a set of interviews with, I'm hopeful, a contested primary, a, congress, a contested congressional primary, having both the candidates uh, for either party, if I can get them. I have one commitment in one district. I have to get a commitment from the second person, which I think will be forthcoming, in terms of hearing from a candidate, not in terms of campaign, but in terms of what they're doing, what they're working on right now, and so forth. And then I'll also integrate some work. Uh, I'll probably have someone like Mike Kagi, who's been active with the CBS New York Times poll, uh, talk a little bit about polling and what's involved. The purpose of this, uh, this particular MOOC, and it'll, it'll be interesting, this may be a MOOC that's given and no one shows up because who's interested in the congressional elections which are in November? I'll repeat it in the fall, and this is all a precursor for the real work that I want to do for 2016 in terms of a MOOC that uh, will be all-encompassing. And I'm working, uh, starting to have conversations with C-SPAN and Project Pericles 
about the possibility of their co-sponsoring it with me and uh, providing some funds. But there are some things that, let me talk specifically about this particular MOOC that we're working on now. Uh, I'm not particularly either adept or a, a seasoned person in terms of distance learning. I still use chalk and eraser in most of the classrooms that I am. I have ventured into eye clickers. I use eye clickers regularly. I find them very, a very good way to get students to uh, comment on things that they may not want to comment on. And once they see the range of response to a set of questions, I get very good discussions going often on discrimination, on civil rights, on e income e inequality, and so forth which are much harder to get started without their having at least some initial anonymity. Um, but having said all that, I really became very interested in this uh, as a build on to other things I've done in the past and with some different teaching approaches. Back in 1992, I, when I was teaching at Purdue University, I did a course that had 500 students in, it's a presidential campaign course and we integrated a lot of C-SPAN material into it. That particular course was then broadcast on a variety of about nine public uh, broadcasting stations in, in universities around the Midwest. Total audience, probably close to 30, 35,000 people was estimated. So you talk about having to be careful what you say, both on and off uh, the lecture, uh, but I became, I think, fairly good at that, and at the end, most people were saying, are you a Republican, are you a Democrat? We can't tell from the way you've covered these things. Because my point is that in terms of civic education, you can cover this material in a nonpartisan way and in a way that really brings the process home. And I think this is really where the APSA has a role to play, and I really hope that uh, there is a development of, of more interest in civic education in MOOCs. Now, this particular MOOC, okay, for you, those of you who might be interested in doing one in the future, I think you have to decide a variety of things from the very beginning. First one is, it, what, what type of MOOC is this going to be? Okay, uh, going back to the earlier comment, this is a MOOC X. This is a traditional MOOC, massive, open, online, no credit, okay? No credit, no cost. All you have to do, click on, enroll, and you're in. Okay. Uh, second thing, and I think that's important because you know, MOOCs can be used to increase enrollment, MOOCs can be used in a variety of ways. Uh, this MOOC is simply meant to uh, have people come in and learn about the congressional elections of 2014 and the importance of those elections. Now, uh, I'm fortunate in that I did have some support for this. Uh, I get no release in terms of teaching time. This is on an overload basis. But I did get some support from a Thinkfinity grant that Verizon Foundation had with PACE. And I also, uh, PACE also has a program for undergraduate research. So I have an undergraduate research student helping me. And through the Thinkfinity grant, I was able to hire probably the most important person in the team, and that's who I call a techie. This is an undergraduate who's responsible for a lot of the things that we're gonna try to do in here. We're trying to start slow and build up. Now, one thing I need to caution you about, and someone mentioned this earlier, um, I believe Sarah mentioned it earlier, and I think this is very important, and that is that the amount of time on a MOOC, most people argue when you look at the literature uh, that it's at least three to four, and some people argues, e argue even six to eight times the amount of time that it takes to do a traditional course, to design it, to implement it, and to administer it properly. So I would say don't undertake a MOOC as something that you think you're going to do lightly and put together lightly. Uh, so next thing is set your objectives carefully. For instance, what audience are you aiming for? How much and what type of knowledge do you want to convey? Okay. So for instance, do I want to give uh, the stu students on this uh, so much information that they become so confused that they can't understand, they can't separate the trees from the forest? Okay. So I'm trying to provide the forest with the mo more important trees such as how candidates are chosen, how things are funded, what's the role of party primaries, what's the role of go a state government in this process, and so forth and so on. One of the key things I'll be working in here is how congressional elections are really tied to federalism. And you need to understand, going back to the Constitution, so I get a chance to, uh, I'll do a lecture or two on the constitutional impact on congressional elections 2014, okay, in terms of the way we choose um, our members. So I think that's important. Next thing is um, you need to find a site to host this for you. 
and I think there are a variety of sites out there, edX has promised that they're going to make widely available public sites. Uh, in the letter from them that I got last week, they said they weren't quite ready to make that announcement. Uh, they weren't quite ready to, to do that yet. And once that's available, then you have the ability to be on edX. Uh, Pace University uh, is, uh, has Blackboard, uses Blackboard regularly, and because of that, uh, I'm, I'm going to be using course sites. I wanted to be able to show you the, um, the course description and everything that would be up on course sites. It was supposed to go up last night. It's not up, so I'm not able to show you that. Um, you also need to decide some basics, okay? How long is you going to have each lecture? Now, I've been told from four or five different sources, anywhere from students, the five-minute rule, to the 20-minute rule. So I'm trying to aim my lectures for 12 minutes. Now think about it for a moment. Those of you who traditionally teach know that in 12 minutes, you're either barely into the discussion or you're at a critical point. So it means going back and really rewriting everything. And also, this particular MOOC is gonna have 24 sections, 24 sessions. Okay. Uh, it's going to have 24 sessions over an eight-week period. We'll be releasing uh, a week at a time uh, starting March the 3rd. Um, we also are wanted to make sure that we had discussion rooms and we have a blog that we're going to have active. Okay, and how are we going to, you know, do we, do we uh, review blog comments? Uh, I came to the conclusion that yes, I'm going to have an undergraduate do that, my undergraduate research assistant's going to do that, mainly because we, uh, one of the things we'll talk about is everyone has to agree to a level of civility in terms of discussion and so forth, and I don't want, uh, I don't want the blog unedited, at least initially. We'll see, maybe next time we'll decide not to do that. Uh, just let me show you, if I might then, what, one of the things we did, which was really very interesting to do, we decided to try to get some interest started. We, we created a website. Hopefully, there it is, okay. Um, and this particular site, if it shows in, let's see. So anyone who goes, if you go to Google and then uh, Google Congressional Elections 2014.com, this is what you come up with, okay? And the interesting thing about this is when we were sitting, when students and I were sitting around really in December trying to figure this out, we said, well, is that domain, what domain names are out there? So we Google, I mean, we, we went to, uh, we actually used GoDaddy to get the domain. We, no one had Congressional Elections 2014. There were other variations, but Congressional Elections 2014, not there. So, needless to tell you, I've already bought Presidential Election 2016, <laughs> and I'm working on uh, securing Presidential Election 2014 and Congressional Elections 2018, okay, uh, as, as we go through this. Um, so, there sh should be a clock clicking here somewhere. It's really a countdown, but let me show you. This is, we, we have on here clearly what we're gonna be covering. We have the important dates for anyone who comes across this. This just went up last week. Uh, we started with, an we, we put a blog on here, and question number one, help us design the course. Tell us what you wanna know. And I think that's really gonna be interesting to see what kind of a response we get on that. And then uh, we have, a, we introduce ourselves, the three of us and then we have a way for people to contact us. So that's where we are there, and we're hopeful that that will generate some support. Now, my uh, one student who's very adept with social media is trying to get this out to a variety, as many sources as possible in terms of um, getting the material, uh, getting this website out in terms of generating interest. You'll notice that we do not, oh, here's our countdown clock. <laughs> I, avoid look, I avoid looking at that because I realize how much work we have to do in the next 23 days. Uh, you know, I suppose at about five, five days out, I'll be on the parapets ready to jump off one of the buildings in New York because we do have a lot to do uh, to get ready. Uh, but by doing this, we were hopeful that we were able to capture some audience, okay? In addition to people who just normally might be checking the course sites site, 
we may be able to get some people of interest who, who have interest. We do not have yet, and we need to put in what's something he's working on this weekend, is a direct way for someone to go from this right to core sites and pre-register. And that's what, that's what they're working on this weekend. Uh, and hopefully we'll have that done by Monday. So in fact, if you go here, say, well, yeah, I might be interested, you can go to core sites, get some preliminary information. Now, the other thing that I want to stress, and I think this is really important, and I think we as political scientists, I think we as teachers and we as researchers really have an obligation here. And that is to, to, to build in significant learning assessment. And I debated how to do this. Uh, I've done some research in the past trying to look at uh, evaluation models and so forth. And I decided what I was going to do is try to have two components to it. The first component will be research on those who are in the MOOC. Who are they? How long do they stay? What is their background? So to come into the MOOC, when you get to the registered and the MOOC starts, you're going to be asked to take about a 10 point a 10 question, what I call, from, usually I call it a pretest. I'm not going to call it a pretest here because for this course, since you get no credit, and all you get, the first 500 people are told you're going to get a certificate. Okay. A certificate of no, with no academic credit. Okay. We have to make that very clear. Keep waiting for the university attorney to call me and say, what are you doing? And so forth. So far, that hasn't happened. Uh, but the assessment then would ask everyone to complete these 10 questions. At the end of the semester, I'll repeat, uh, in the end of the eight weeks, I'll repeat the 10 questions to whoever's left and whoever fills it out. So there is an interesting comparison. Those who signed up came and began, and those who left. Is there a difference? Or maybe the people who left, uh, and I can do this by individual, maybe the people who stayed were those who already had the highest amount of information. Okay? And maybe it wasn't. We don't know. Okay, so that's one comparison. The other comparison that I want to do, and I have a very small, I'm teaching the course also as a regular course to in class uh, to uh, probably about 20 students. I'd hope for more, maybe in the fall I'll have more. But I can compare the MOOC results with the in class student results to see what students are learning in both. And again, because of the small ends involved, I won't be able to do a lot of sophisticated statistical work, but I can, at least can do some comparisons between them. Uh, so my point here is that I think it's really important that we as academic instructors and as uh, researchers try to always link, have a link to try to add to the knowledge about MOOCs. Okay? It is a new industry. Na I would argue it's still in its nation stage. Uh, it's gone through three stages. We're maybe in the third stage, but it's still relatively early in it. And the nice thing about MOOCs is it's definitely a cottage industry. You've all seen in recent weeks, I'm sure, the ad the, for all the great things that began in a garage. Okay. All right. Well, this is almost, you know, you can create your own MOOC literally within your, with using a garage concept. Now, uh, one other thing, a couple other points that I want to mention, then I'll be glad to take any questions. Uh, take advantage of whatever technical expertise you can find within your university. And you'll be surprised. Uh, you can often find someone in educational media or instructional technology who sees the opportunity to be involved on a new project or to work with someone who's working on something new instead of the same old, same old, getting very interested in this and being able to help you a great deal in terms of procuring things and things that you need. I mean, one of the questions that I still have, I start to tape, I start to do the video in, in 10 days, and I'm still trying to decide exactly where I want to do the video. You know, things range from trying to get access to Federal Hall, uh, first uh, site of, of Congress uh, in New York City, to maybe using, doing something right in front of the Capitol, to just being in my office with a background of whatever I might uh, put up. Not, not quite sure yet. I have a great tie that has uh, donkeys and um, elephants on, so I'll probably wear that occasionally uh, when I talk about partisan aspects of this. So there are a lot of these types of questions, but take advantage of any technical expertise you can get. I have a person at Core Sites who's helping me. Uh, that's been very helpful, but they're not on campus. You know, they're a uh, uh, cell phone call away, and depending on how many messages they have, it takes a while to get resolved. The other thing that I think is important when you do your, your course, if at all possible, 
I'm going to have a, at least probably once every two weeks, and I hope once a week, a live discussion where I'm going to be online using probably Collaborate. Collaborate. If you're familiar with Collaborate, which is part of the Blackboard package, they can take up to 1,000 people. So hopefully I can be online conversing, having an interactive conversation with whatever students come on. I'll try to, depending on the makeup of where the student body is from, uh, I'll try to alter it time-wise and so forth. And then we also have the blog. We're also going to have some discussion rooms where if people want to move, go into a discussion room to talk about something, they can. So I think this is important to try to make sure that students have a feeling that uh, you're there, that they're able to ask questions. And most importantly, if you get a question, you have to answer it timely. Those of you who teach online, I know, are, are probably up to 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning answering questions. I, I, in my courses, I permit students to um, email me any time with questions. And usually the questions come in 2 to 3 to 4 o'clock in the morning, okay? And it'll be someone who's working late or whatever. These traditional students are still up late, but it's always very interesting to then get back to them and then later follow up and find out if they've answered things. Now, the last thing I want to mention, I believe the last thing I want to mention here, is something that very few people will tell you to do, but I would recommend that you do it, and that is that you keep your own personal evaluation of how much time it takes, where you had difficulty, where there are problems, where, and then as the course unfolds, keep track of all of the glitches, keep track of all the problems, uh, not necessarily because you can fix it, but because it helps you next time you try to design things. And more importantly, I think it gives you a different perspective if you're evaluating yourself and evaluating the process that you're in. Hopefully all of you do that on a regular basis in terms of the courses that you teach, in terms of your, your feeling towards, I mean, I've had some classes that I thought, oh gosh, I gotta go teach them again. It's, I can't get in, I have other classes that I walk into and I feel as if uh, it's my first day of teaching because they're, they're vibrant, they're alive, they're interested. So you need to keep your perspectives, I think, on this. Uh, realize that, I would say if you're gonna go into the developing and teaching of MOOCs, try to do so on a sustained basis. Try to do either the same course several times over so that you can, as Sarah mentioned, uh, what they're doing at Maryland in terms of being able to uh, look at this as a learning process for themselves. So I think in many respects, you're learning as much as students are. Now, the last thing I would say is that I think this is really where MOOCs, all, there's been a lot of discussion about MOOCs, okay? And when, you know, when uh, Stephen Colbert has edX on the show, and when Tom Friedman is talking about MOOCs in his column and so forth, MOOCs are definitely, at least a year or so ago, were the hot item, okay? I think they've cooled somewhat now with all the criticism that's come out uh, in, in terms of in, uh, arguments people have made against MOOCs, but I think there's a very unique role for MOOCs to play in terms of civic education, civic competency, and I also want to argue that in terms of our electoral process and understanding the United States, I'm interested not just in educating the American student or the American person who's interested in taking this, I'm interested in people from around the world who want to learn about the American system. So ultimately, as I get ready for the 2016 and as I do some changes in this for 2014 in the fall, I want to build in some comparative aspects to it. Okay. Um, and I think we have an obligation to do so, so it's not just American-centric, but I think this is a way for us as political scientists to do what I think is very important for us to do, to help to raise the level of political literacy about the American system and about our electoral process. So that is the ultimate goal that I'm trying to work towards. Uh, I hope to uh, have some time in a sabbatical to, to think more broadly about this and do some writing. But I would hope that the APSA, I would hope all of you in this room uh, remain interested in MOOCs and attempt to develop them. I also hope that the APSA will follow through and do more formally. Uh, when I, in the paper I talk about tomorrow, I'm, I don't want to say critical, but at least I observe that the APSA has been very slow to really bring discussion of MOOCs to the forefront as, as an association. So hopefully that will change. Okay, so I'll be glad to answer any questions that you might have. And feel free, uh, by the way, to uh, come into the MOOC. Uh, the more the merrier. Uh, 
So we hope uh, to get, uh, ideally I'd like to get a thousand students in there. I have no idea how many I'll get since it's not for credit, but we'll just wait and see. So any questions that I can answer? Yes. mentioned that you're offering in a MOOC essentially the same course that you're offering in a traditional format or something similar. Uh, what's been the reaction of your university? Are you getting encouragement, blowback, indifference to offering for free in a MOOC what they're charging for? Uh, I've got to tell you that as I've talked to people from my departmental colleagues to people in the Dyson College, which is our College of Arts and Sciences, to the dean, uh, to the provost, uh, there's a, I don't want to say, there is a lack of knowledge about MOOCs, a lack of understanding about them, and since I had this validated by getting the Thinkfinity grant through Verizon, uh, it made it possible for me to do it. Uh, so no one's really raised that question with me. I'm waiting for someone to do so. Uh, and the one thing I try to avoid is any contact with the university attorney because <laughs> I know that as soon as uh, some of these issues get raised, I'll be months before they get involved, before they get resolved. No, I just wanted to put together a couple of threads that come from this discussion. And first of all, I should say that uh, Credo Reference is actually both a UK and a US company. So I spend a lot of time in England and about six or seven years ago, under Bush's, when Bush was president, I was attended a lecture at Good Enough College in London by Richard Dreyfus, who was giving a talk about impeaching President Bush, and he was talking about the need for a democracy driver's license. And it's, it's actually interesting, because actually all throughout the EU, they have something called the Internet Driver's License, which is something that's a program given through all the public libraries that allows you to be trained and certified that you are actually, a, as a citizen, prepared for the use of the Internet. Now I fold back to last year's APSA, and Bob Graham talking about his book, The, the Democracy's Owner's Manual. So all of this comes back to what you're talking about in terms of the elections and what John talked about in terms of could APSA have a role in terms of having a MOOC with a certification that was a certification on how to run a democracy. And I think it would be a really neat idea. I just wanted to add, it was interesting that you haven't received any pushback from the university. In our contract, we are not allowed to teach an in-person course with any of the same material at the same time. And there's very strict requirements on how we can repurpose the material that we've designed for this MOOC in any future. If we wanted to turn it into a continuing education unit or something along those lines, there's very strict requirements on that. But I had a question, if you could expand on how you're using the blog, is that within the course platform or is that kind of an outside that you're going to reference together? No, it will be inside the course uh, outline and uh, the idea is to permit students to raise any issues that they want to related to the course, uh, to ask questions, to use as a discussion. There will also be particular discussion forums each week. Uh, if, for instance, when I lecture on uh, redistricting, okay, there may be uh, a, re a discussion forum on What's redistricting? Have you had any personal experience in your state? What's been the aspect of out outcome of it, and so forth? Going back to your earlier comment, your first comment, just let me add. Um, I think since this is being done on a no fee basis for the student, uh, I think the university is less concerned about some of these issues. But I also have a provost who believes that the future of the university is in the flipped classroom, and his. His approach and his basic argument, and he's, uh, he, he's gone to a, a variety of the uh, business uh, forums for higher education, his basic argument is it is a way to save money. Okay? And that you use the flipped flip classroom, you import someone else's lecture, you pay a fee for it, and then you have junior faculty or uh, untenured faculty, adjuncts or teaching assistants do the in-class work. So I took great delight when I was able to send him some material in the last couple of weeks which showed the field classrooms didn't increase learning as outcomes and also may not lower cost. Okay. So yeah, some interesting things there. So I would just hope that you continue uh, being active with your interest in MOOCs. I think as a discipline we need to do more. Individually we need to do more. So if I can ever be of any help or answer questions, feel free to drop me a note uh, at my email address. Thank you.